in a sea of sameness, you will never stand out if you pitch your product, if you ask for 15 minutes of, your, of their time, uh, if, if you have, you know, uh, a lot of uh, a big sales logo in your signature and all that kind of stuff. So I always try to do the opposite of that. I'm trying to really just be a problem finder. Um, and if you can do that, I think you're going to you're going to really stand out. All right, dude, let's get into this. So I want to start really at the beginning of the sales cycle, right? So you speak a lot about like prospecting and leads and all that kind of good stuff for you or in general, like how do you go about that process? Like how do you prospect? How do you find potential leads? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Darren. So I uh, have actually an eight step system or an eight step process that I follow in my own funnel. And the first step I call targeting. So targeting is all about knowing who your ICP is, your ideal customer profile. And I'm trying to be as specific as possible there because I find that, you know, the, the classic spraying and praying approach or, you know, a lot of people, they have a sort of a vague idea who their ICP is. They're like, I sell to, you know, CFOs or, you know, to, to CISOs, you know, to cybersecurity companies. I'm like, that's great. You, you have an idea of maybe the persona or even the industry, but who exactly is your ideal customer profile in the sense that what are actually the pains that they have? What are actually mm -hmm. visible triggers that you can observe um, that you can leverage for your outreach? So that timing piece um, is critical. And I'll take myself ex as an example with Salesforce. I mean, how many times does a company buy a CRM? They don't do it every month or every six months or once a year or every other year. They usually do it every five years or so. They reconsider their contract, maybe maybe every three to five years, because that's the length of an average CRM contract. But even then, they'll think twice about doing the migration project, which costs a lot of consultant resources and inter internal resources. So for me, knowing who is in market to buying CRM is, is critical. So the targeting piece is, is, is step one. Mm -hmm. How did you find that though? How do you know that certain contracts are coming to an end, let's say? Yeah. So of course, I would love if there was a website that lists all the companies yeah. in the world and the start and end date of their CRM contracts, right? Uh, um, so the truth is that in the framework that I use, uh, I try to... And this is really a thought exercise that every salesperson needs to do, right? This is really a brainstorm exercise. And this has a lot to do with your subject matter expertise. Um, what are visible signs or triggers that can indicate that your buyer is in market? So for CRM system, and I personally, I was selling to um, VC, so venture, venture capital backed startups and scale-ups in Switzerland. So I was like, what's, the primary trigger for me that they might invest in a CRM. Well, in my case, it was pretty simple. It's funding, right? So whenever they get a seed, series A, series B funding event, that's a massive trigger for me to reach out because that means they have cash at hand. Of course, okay. their idea is not to throw that cash into Salesforce right away, but yeah. it's just a trigger for me that usually they go from, let's say, uh, a product development stage to a go-to-market stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so basically market. you're analyzing other things outside the company that you're seeing, like whether it's like events or any public information and seeing, can you use that to your advantage? Yes. I look at things like funding, headcount growth, executive leadership change, open job <clears throat> roles that they have, the, the tech stack that they use. Some people have things like intent data, uh, like Bombora, that they can look at. Google alerts on named accounts, mergers and acquisitions, expansion mm -hmm. into new countries. There are so many things that can indicate a lot of things, right? So it's up for interpretation what these triggers mean. But having the trigger and a few valid, it should make sense, right? But a yep. few valid assumptions in place, how this trigger can affect your target persona mm -hmm. and you're already way ahead of, of most people. That's interesting. Comparing that to the spray and pray model, like 
you're doing all this individual research about a company, do you ever go down the route of like automation emails, really trying to not necessarily blast, but okay, you have an idea, you have a vague idea of the companies you want and then going through an automation sequence flow? Any sort of inkling on that? So this is a shocker for a lot of people, but I've actually never used a sequencer like Outreach or Salesloft. Mm -hmm. Simple reason, we don't have it at Salesforce. <laughs> we, have <laughs> our, uh, we have our own solution, which is called uh, High Velocity Sales or now Sales Engagement. Um, it's primarily used by our SDR and BDR teams um, to kind of, you know, accelerate the, 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 but it's more for the inbound lead process. But for outbound, we actually don't have this as our tech stack. So I had to find ways to go without such a sequencing solution. And that's why my approach that I developed over the years um, is, is fully, is for the most part manual. And I would say in the, in the, let's say, uh, in the patch and the territory that, that I've had for the last year with the VC companies, I mean, I had like, I had, I would say, a list of 50 focus accounts. Okay. And I was working together with my SDR to go through those 50 accounts throughout the year. So because the quantity wasn't so massive, we were actually able to look at each account one by one identify the triggers but in a very systematic way so i use and this is part of the course uh, that i have i actually have a prospecting prospecting tracker that has a research tab mm -hmm. and in the research tab i operationalize the data points that i want to collect so what's the headcount growth what's the fu last funding event and and who invested how much um you know what's the intent data on sales navigator like i basically have cells that I just need to fill out, which uh, accelerates my research process. Mm. And I have a second tab, which is a prospecting tracker. And in there, I have my sequence. So day one is like a triple call, voicemail, uh, voice message, email. Day two is like sales navigator, uh, LinkedIn connection uh, request, putting a face to the name uh, and maybe another call without voicemail and so on. So I have like my five, six, seven day sequence, but I have it in the spreadsheet. And I just tick the boxes. Um, so I follow a, a process, but it's manual. Mm. Before we get into the actual email sequence, because there's so much in you know what you're discussing, I kind of wanted to ask about the scorecard approach you do. So I saw recently when your post was about, you know, you profile individuals and you make sure they, they meet that criteria. And I know, I know you're talking about tech sales. And, you know, for me, it's like agency work for other people. It's completely different. How do you how did you create that? Maybe explain that a bit more detail for people because that's super fucking important to understand your yep. ICP and, and more and more so. So this I think the scorecard you're referring to is my opportunity scorecard. And that's less about scoring your prospect, but it's more about scoring the health of your deal or the health of, of your pipeline. So as an AE, and it really depends in what segment you are, right? But let's say if you're an SMB mid-market segment, like most people are, um, enterprise is a little bit different, but in that segment, at any certain time, you will have between one to two or three dozen opportunities in your pipeline. So mm -hmm. for the year, right? So for the year, you might have anywhere between, you know, 10 up to 20, 30 deals that you're looking at. and if you're a Salesforce user, you might have that as a list or as a Kanban. And it's really hard to have an immediate grasp of where you are in your deals. But it's really important because you should structure your day by making sure, first of all, you fill the funnel on the top. So I always start with prospecting. But then the second most important thing is that you progress the pipeline that you have. So where do you start if you have 20 deals? You know, which, which, deal, which deal do you look at first? And that's when I came up with the sort of idea of a heat map or a scorecard to quickly identify which are the healthiest deals, which deals need work and which deals are really unhealthy and should potentially be disqualified or like something like I need to take massive action here. Yeah. And the scorecard is really, really simple. It's just, and I think I have like 10 criteria, you can have more, but it's basically criteria that indicate the health of your deal. So for example, do you have access to a decision? Yeah. Maker? 
Do you have the timeline validated? Do you have a mutual action plan in place? Do you have an external partner involved? Because we do projects with external partners. So that's specific to us. Um, is my internal team, so my solution engineer and my product expert and, and whatnot, aligned? Because we have like four to five people internally on every deal. So there's all these steps that indicate the, the health of a deal. Mm -hmm. And you can also operationalize this nicely in a, in a simple Google spreadsheet where you have just the name of the opportunity, then those 10 questions, and then check boxes. And then in the, in the bottom, it'll tell you the score. And maybe you, you put in a nice macro that the number is either green or yellow or red, and you can quickly see where, where you stand. That's applicable to every industry, man, isn't it? Like, of course, in the tech space, like you have so much stakeholders on your side. You know, you you might even have compliance and legal and all that kind of shit involved. But it's for anyone. It's for everyone. And this is why what you do is so universal. That's why I love it because, like, you can tie it to everything. I feel like the AE, like SDR, BDR space is like trying to aim for best in class. But these principles are applicable for every business, really, aren't they? They, they should be because, um, because it's, it's just, I find it's just uh, fundamental sales principles and sales management um, principles. And I mean, what I learned, and, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to Salesforce is we operationalize a lot of stuff. Uh, we have like a super high level of, we call it OPEX, operational excellence. We have like very strict KPIs with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing there is that they're not always in the favor of the individual sales rep. They're, they tend to be mostly in the favor of the sales management and the sales leadership because it allows them to make smarter strategic decisions for the organization. They're not always rep friendly. Okay. Um, but I kind of use the same uh, or similar formats and ideas to help the reps and a common thing is that people stare at their pipeline and they have no idea where they stand and i'm like just take a scorecard it takes like a minute to fill out because you know the answers to those questions and it'll just it'll just tell you the truth right the data will always will always reveal everything man it will always tell you where where it is do you think that many people like uh focus maybe too far up on the pipeline you know, at the top of the funnel or at the bottom of the funnel where by things deals have been closed, do people kind of forget the middle part? Is that something that you try to work on? Uh, that's that's hard to, to say. Um, I think so so here's the thing, right? And I think this is this comes to no surprise, right? Most mm -hmm. people struggle with prospecting. So mm -hmm. most people struggle to generate new pipeline, especially right now in this economic situation uh, uh, that we are where you know people don't have budgets or at least they have very restricted budgets mm -hmm. um and the overall the overall mentality is very much protect resources and 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 protect finances so selling in 2023 late 2022 early 2023 is much harder than it was like a year or a year and a half ago like i remember my first year as ae so that was you know 2021 it was just crazy like um people were really you know just so loose with how they spent their money and it also reflected <laughs> in my own sales performance like i was closing deals where today i think like i shouldn't have closed those deals or oh i God. wouldn't close those deals today because you know the, the 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 mentality is so very different so i think today the toughest thing for people is to generate net new pipeline mm -hmm. uh and this is, I mean, this is reflected in, in my one-on-one -on -one coachings. This is the majority of my one-on-one -on -one coachings. And amongst those are enterprise AEs who have many, many years of sales experience, but who have relied heavily on inbound or on deals that their CEO brought in, right? Um, or their SDR brought in. Uh, and those, some of those people that I coach are phenomenal closers. So they know everything about getting to power, getting the decision maker, uh, getting ink on paper, but when it comes to the cold outreach to someone they don't know and who doesn't know them, they they struggle big time. How do you stand out so? How do you stand out in your outreach? 
Yeah, like like at the moment where boy, you know, everybody's closing down fucking they're batting in the hatches. What is it you do to influence the people you need to influence? Like how do you stand out from that element? Yeah. So I would say the number one key thing is a problem statement. So when you reach out to a prospect, so let's say I, I reach out to, to a chief revenue officer, to a CRO, um, I would say 99% like a very high number, like 95% of the outreach that I see goes, hey, dear CRO, this is what we do, yeah. right? So they instantly start with, this is what we do. And then is this a priority? And they forget that the CRO has many different priorities, right? He probably gets dozens of sales emails a day and maybe a handful of cold calls, although cold calling at the moment seems to be a rare thing almost, but definitely gets many, many emails. Um, probably works a 50 to 60 hour a week in this book back to back. Um, has you know a big budget to manage with like a dozen different vendors in their tech stack. So just saying, hey, I'm another one out there is, is very ineffective, but that's what most people do. What I try to do in my messaging and my framework, I, I call my framework TPC or TPQ, which, is, which really stands for trigger and then problem statement, and then either call to action or, or validating question. Um, so the trigger is what I mentioned earlier, right? So, and John Barrows calls this the why you, why now? So basically mm -hmm. within the first three seconds, your prospect should know why you're reaching out to them and, and why you're reaching out right now. So for example, with the CRO, I would say something like, hey, dear CRO, reaching out with regards to the 25% headcount growth in your sales team. So that's a trigger that I saw on SalesNav that their sales team is growing by 25%. And in that moment, I'm just referring to that. And in that moment, it shows that number one, I'm not a robot. This email is not automated, so I observed something that's relevant. And at least in this moment, I have his or her attention. Now, the, the second critical piece is that I tie this trigger to a problem statement. And it could, it could go like something like this. Um, talking to other CROs in your space, we know that a strong headcount growth in the sales team usually comes with, you know, big challenges in the onboarding process or big challenges in... Um, keeping your, 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 your SLAs and the sales development team, like whatever it is, onboarding, yeah. sales management, whatever, there has to be a problem statement in there. And it has to be something that relates to your, to your prospect. Um, so that's the second critical piece is that you have a trigger, instant relevancy, and then you have a problem statement that relates to that trigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of people overcomplicate this, it, but it can be really simple. It's like, hey, I saw that this is going on. And because I talk to people like you all day, I know that this is most likely a challenge, uh, a challenge. So it's a problem statement. And this is the first email in my sequence. And I, I, like, to, um, I like to finish that email just with a validating question. It's like, is this relevant at the moment? Is this worth a chat? Um, some people do the reverse. They're like, is this completely irrelevant at the moment? Um, and there's not even a pitch in that email. Mm. There's not even a mention of who I work for or what I do. I like to put this in the, in the second or in the third email of the sequence. And the second or third email, is that if they don't respond or if they do respond? That's, that's when they don't respond. So when, when someone respond. responds... Um, I think your sequence should always change. Uh, ideally, if someone responds and, and they have their number and the signature, instantly call. Um, or if you don't have access to that number, I mean, it really strongly de de depends on the response. Um, of course. If the response is not interested, <laughs> then yeah, I would of course. A typical objection. And um, every objection is a chance for discovery. So when I get something like, not interested, I'd be like, completely fair. Would you mind sharing um, why you are not interested? Is it that you already have a solution in place for this problem? Um, 
Is it that you have completely conflicting priorities that you need that 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 or you have higher priorities at the moment? So basically, I'm basically asking the prospect um, to, and then I say something like, um, "Would appreciate if you share this because then I can put it in my CRM and and take you out of my sequence, right?" So to give them an easy way out. Um, well, yeah, I find that I find that um, maybe to finish off on this email piece, I find that a lot of sellers they try to put as much as possible in the first email. Mm -hmm. And it's usually too much in the sense that the email is too long or too wordy or it's too much information to prospect process. Now, remember, your prospect, if it's a CFO, any type of C-level, imagine they get a dozen emails a day and they have to scan through all of them and they all look like sales emails. So you really need a pattern disrupt. And a great mm -hmm. pattern disrupt is to say, hey, this is a trigger that I saw. This is a problem statement. The more specific you can be, the better because the more it'll stand out. You really want your 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 buyer to think like, hey, wow, I mean, that's exactly what we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, so it also can't be too obvious, let's say. So yeah. the more specific you can be, the better. And and no pitch in there, right? And you can because you can do that in your second, third, fourth email, you can come with. What's the business impact of this problem? Who are your references and how, how have you uh, helped other similar customers? Um, how do you actually solve this problem, right? So what does your solution do in one sentence? Maybe, and so on. I could go off here, but yeah. Of course, man, this is very insightful. This is super helpful. It's like, I'm trying to think through so many different examples of it. One question I have off this though is like, so of course, like CFOs get a shitload of messages or whoever it is, the decision maker gets those messages. But ultimately, they kind of do expect you to try to get them on a call or have some sort of call to action or whatever. Is it still detrimental to put that in the first instance, the first email when it's coming anyway? <laughs> you know, like they know you're a sales guy, you're selling something. Does that make sense? As in like, are you trying to delay the process by ultimately leaving it out or is there advantage to, to leaving it out? So... <clears throat> The way I see it is that um, every high value prospect needs to protect their time. They need to protect their time. They need to protect their attention. And so they have these brain mechanics. You know, our brain is, is really powerful in the sense that it can filter out a lot of information that's not relevant at the moment, right? So, so our brain is really good at seeing patterns and just blocking things out. But if something um, if something stands out from the pattern, we instantly see it because it could be potentially a threat, you know, in the jungle or whatever. And it's the same with uh, prospects reading emails. So in a sea of sameness, you will never stand out if you pitch your product, if you ask for 15 minutes of, your, of their time, uh, if, if you have, you know... Uh, a lot of uh, a big sales logo in your signature and all that kind of stuff. So I always try to do the opposite of that. I'm trying to really just be a problem finder. Um, and if you can do that, I think you're gonna you're gonna really stand out. And to your point, so why am I delaying the the asking for their time? I'm not trying to delay it, but I'm not asking for time until I know that they actually have a problem I can solve. So I need the, I need some, because booking a meeting is the first sale. Booking a meeting is getting to the first yes. And I can't do so until I know that there's actually value in it for the prospect. Mm. So I find that once I can, once I can point out a problem that's really painful for my prospect, then they're going to be open to talk or, or then they're going to be open to listening. Mm. Not before. If I if I if I if I say hey problem solution if I come in with the yeah. solution before I, before I know the problem actually exists, um, then then I'm doing something wrong. Interesting, interesting. Because for some businesses, you could maybe observe the problem from afar, but you don't necessarily pitch it, or you may even not want to pitch it in the first email. But yeah, this is this is super helpful, man. This is awesome. I want to just move on to the discovery phase, just so we get everything in. Okay. So. One of your great tweets is uh, deals are won and lost in discovery. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Mm. 
deals are won and lost in discovery um, for several reasons. But, um, you know, some deals are meant to be closed, but you don't close them because you forget to ask certain important questions, right? Uh, you miss certain things. So, so one example could be, let's say you're in a deal and uh, you're your fiercest competitor is also is also in the deal and, and fighting for the business. But there is this one question that if you had asked it, it would have been clear that um, you have a key USB that the customer needs that basically helps you win the deal over the competition. But you forget to ask the question, so you lose the deal because the, com because the competitor is cheaper and they win against you on price. So asking certain questions that um that uh or forgetting to ask certain questions that help you win the deal in the scoping phase opposite example is certain deals that you're trying to close that are just not meant to be closed why because either this customer is not a good fit for you or this customer is not really committed to you or they just will never give you access to the decision maker right so that's why discovery is so important is because you want to make sure that you qualify the right deals and you dis and you disqualify the deals that you shouldn't be working on. Mm. That's why discovery it, is so important. Yeah. It, it's interesting, man, because some people, even myself, would consider that to be like, okay, you know, you got them on discovery. It's the first yes. Let's just try fucking close this. Does that make sense? Especially maybe not B2B sales, but like smaller scales stuff. It's like, let's just fucking close it. So people are like, let's just kind of get it over the line. Whereas you take that very much like I'm interviewing you vibe as much as you're interviewing me to see, are you a good fit for me? Yeah. 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 hundred percent. But wait, yeah, go ahead. Put, that's, put just, a that's a very, that's a very different approach though, you know, and it's very unique. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's differences between, let's say, maybe a very transactional sale. Mm -hmm. um, so at Salesforce, a very transactional deal would be something like 5K or less ARR. Yeah. That would be very transactional at Salesforce. And back in 2021, I would close like one or two of those per week. So like very transactional, like, you know, a, a, a one week or to, to two week sales cycle. Um, and that was very much the like, okay, we do a quick discovery and then we try to hard close this customer. Um, and, you know, a certain number of them I would be able to close and a certain number I wouldn't. And I had kind of my strategies there, how, how I did a quick demo and how I positioned myself and all that. Once you go into more strategic deals, so let's call it like a 50K deal, which is something I'm very familiar with, or a 100K deal or more, which I'm less familiar with, but... Um, you know, at the larger the deal size is just the more stakeholders are involved and the more feedback loops you have and so on. So the <clears throat> fundamentals stay the same. The problem is, and I've done both, right? I've, I've, I've certainly had deals that I tried to close, but I should have never closed. Or they, they were never meant to close. They were never meant to be closed. Why? It's because I wasn't the best vendor for them, right? Salesforce is not for everyone. We like to believe it, but it's not for everyone, you know, for, for, so, for some companies, they need something simpler. Maybe they need something cheaper. Um, maybe the customer actually doesn't have, you know, it, it's a maturity question. Or sometimes it's also a mindset question. Sometimes it's a resources question. So when we try to sell to companies that we're not meant to be so, sold to, it's just, it's just not going to happen. That's one, that's one uh, aspect is the fit. And then the other aspect is... Um, I call this the willingness to engage, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is where the whole piece of mutual action plan comes into play. Is that uh, because I, at the end of every discovery call, I put the mutual action plan or I present the mutual action plan. Um, and this is basically the key tool for me to qualify or disqualify is because I'm explaining to the customer, okay, your customer and last 30 to 45 minutes, we validated that you have problem X, Y, Z. It costs you ABC money every month or every quarter. 
we both agree that Salesforce could be a potentially interesting solution to look into. Let me explain to you what the process looks like. And then I basically explain to them everything that's going to happen between now and the signature and then the implementation project all the way until the go live. Mm -hmm. And then I just sit back and, and, and I listen to what they have to say. And what often happens uh, is that they say, ah, no, we cannot sign by this date. Or, uh, yeah, I cannot sign this. I don't have the budget. We need person X, Y, Z. Or, uh, yeah, there's other projects that are actually conflicting. So you can distill out a lot of the red flags mm -hmm. and, and also a lot of the bullshit. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, and, and this creates a lot of friction. The, the customer will, or the prospect will say uh, no to a lot of the things because all of a sudden they realize all of the time they need, all of the internal selling that your champion needs to do, all the approvals that they need to get. And they realize, okay, I actually don't want to do this. But in this moment, you did them and yourself a favor because you're like, okay, if, if this cannot happen right now, you know, we can part ways as friends and maybe we, we regroup in three months. But this is just not going to happen now versus not doing this critical piece and just going mm -hmm. on with the process. But at some point they start ghosting you and you're like, yeah. what's going on? You know, we discussed that we would do this. Like, so there's a lot to play, man. I, lo I love that because, you know, you need to be a, a good fit for other person. It's like putting a square peg through a circle hole. It just doesn't work all the time. You need it to be a perfect harmony. But then there's a, there's a gray area. Okay. Because, what I often find is like, well, recently, it all comes down to price. It's, all, it's always price, right? And I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes I think that if I tell someone 5K, 4K, 3K, 2K, or $500, they'll still say it's too much, right? Yeah. <laughs> do you ever get that feel? It's just certain people that will always say it's too much. So how do you deal with that type of uh, objection? Yeah. So again, here, I think I would like to differentiate a little bit between the, the strategic SaaS sale and maybe the more transactional sale. And, and I do both. Like I, my one-on-one -on -one coaching is, is, you know, it's a, it's a, a smaller to mid four figure deal. So the, what I used to sell at Salesforce, I sell now in the form of my own, uh, uh, my own coaching service, but the dynamics is very, very similar. I find that it actually doesn't matter so much what you sell whether it's like a service or a SaaS or a product the deal size really determines the dynamics more yeah, than 100%. What, the, 100%. What, what the thing is so selling 5k SaaS and, and selling 5k coaching is very similar in the sense of the of the sales cycle but um let's start with this so the price objection um or the price sensitivity of a customer um always comes down to two things. So the one thing is the price to value discrepancy. So if a customer tells you that 5K is too expensive, that means that they didn't see that your product or service is actually value, uh, is actually worth much more, right? So if you did a good job of demonstrating that your product or service is worth 50K to them in the form of additional revenue, saved costs, or saved time, then 5K is, is, is a steal, right? Yeah. But if they think that it's only worth 5K or less or, or marginally more than 5K, then you will always get that price, uh, price objection. And that's the same in SaaS. If I say, you know, there's a saying that goes, customers will spend six figures to solve a, a seven-figure problem. And that's why... In my strategic SaaS, I always use the gap selling methodology. So there's a there's a book called Gap Sales that teaches uh, mainly discovery, mainly discovery, right? And the gap is basically uh, the the current state that your customer is in, the current uh, painful state that they're in, and the desired future state that they, that they can achieve by investing in you. And that gap has a financial value. And basically your job in a strategic SaaS sale is to quantify how big that gap is by doing a business case, an ROI analysis, by understanding their KPIs and, and also knowing 
how your solution can improve their KPIs, and then having a total cost of ownership analysis over the length of your contract and showing them, hey, you know, we bring you five million more in revenue slash saved costs, but the thing only costs, you know, 500k. And so they're like, yeah, that's a that's a 10x ROI, no brainer. Obviously, yeah. it's not that, as simple as that, but but that's kind of the goal. And you need to do the same. So let's talk about my coaching package, right? So if my coaching package is two thousand five hundred dollars, um, or you know, take someone like uh, take take some take some of the leading coaches in the space, like Ian Koniak or Marcus Chan, who who have even bigger coaching packages than that. You know, how how do you justify the price to to a customer? And the only way is to say, look, um, first of all, what are your challenges, right? So where are you today? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cruising along. I'm hitting like 75% of quota uh, in my last quarter. So where do you want to be? Well, I want to be at least at 90% quota. And I'm like, why not 100%? You know, if you're, not, if you're at 90, you might as well hit 100%. Yeah, you know, I want to go step by step. So whatever it is, you know, between 90 and 100, let's call it 100. So if you go from 75% quota attainment last year mm -hmm. or last quarter, to 100% or more this year, how much is that in additional commissions? That's between 25 and 30K. This is a real example that I'm giving right now. Someone who said this. Uh, yeah, this is between 25 and 30K. So I'm like, okay, does it sound like a good idea to you to invest 2.5K to make an additional 25 to 30K in commissions next year? I mean, it's a 10X ROI, right? Yeah. So that's when... As long as you can make someone believe that you can be, uh, that you can help them in reaching their goal, and the RO, and you can demonstrate, and it doesn't have to be complicated. You you can demonstrate a simple return on uh, on investment. I find that the that the price objection is is going to become negligible. What about in the instances whereby the ROI isn't an increase in revenue? Let's say if it is save time, and let's say if it is um, growth, like growth of whatever service you have or whatever, mm -hmm. how can you justify that when it's like you need to put 5K pennies in, but your return on investment will not be more money, it'll be something else? But it should always be more money. If you save time, that's also money that you're saving, right? Because yeah. you can always attach an hourly wage or an hourly you know, personal cost on, on the time that you're saving, right? Um, and the same goes with the growth of a product. I mean, if it's a growth of a product, then you just need to make, sometimes you need to make assumption because the customer doesn't know the numbers or they haven't thought about it, right? And this is really where the consultative selling aspect comes into play. Do I say, okay, if we can grow this, pro this, this product uh, for you by X percent, you know, how much is this, what's the margin of this product, et cetera, et cetera. You can always calculate things uh, back down to the bottom line. And I think that's what, maybe not in all instances you have to do, but I think at the moment in this whole recession and selling to CFOs environment, or even trying to sell a podcast service to someone who is tight on cash or, or, or selling a coaching service to someone who doesn't have the cash, who's actually going to get a loan from the bank um, or is going to ask a relative uh, for, for the money. Um, to those people, you need to demonstrate it because they want to do it. They just need reasons to justify it to themselves. Yeah, man, this is so fascinating. I love these types of conversations. Like what type of mindset do you try to develop for sales that helps you to try to actually um, you know, close more deals and also become way more connected with the person you're selling to. Yeah. So I have an answer for this, right? So the number one mindset that I always try to have, it's difficult, but um, if you can do it, you're going to be more successful is just make it all about the customer, right? Um, it sounds so cliche and we hear it all the time, but um, if you can actually do this, you will just be way more successful. And I mean, Making it about the customer means, first of all, slowing down. So slowing down in the sense that 
as we discussed earlier, right? You're not coming in hot with the pitch. You're not about me, me, me. You know, you're just actually slowing down, making it all about the prospect. Like, hey, I saw this trigger happened. Uh, you know, I hear from a lot of people like you that this is the problem or business impact that they're facing. Is this actually the case? And um, and then just going with it. And then when you're in a discovery call, you know, really asking the prospect like, hey, you know, what are your challenges? What are your goals? This is the gap. Hey, have you thought about that? that this is how big the gap is and this is how much money it's costing you. And then educating them on the, so this is the mutual action plan, right? Educating, educating them on the process and being like, look, I would love to help you close this gap, right? And reach this desirable future state. This is the process that we need to go through because this is the best practice approach that we have. You know, let me know if there's any criteria on your side, um, what, what that looks like and kind of, finding that overlap between what my best practice looks like and what your policy, your purchase policy and decision process looks like and slowing way down. And when you get like an objection from a, from a customer or from a prospect, never make it personal, right? It's never them rejecting you um, or your company. It's really just most of the time their own internal struggle or conflicting priorities and just slow down and be like, look, it seems like, a few things are going on here. Um, mind sharing more about that, you know, what the, what the challenges are. So overall mindset, like always making it about the prospect, you know, as a salesperson, your job is not to sell. Your job is to help others solve their problems. That's, that's mm -hmm. the big mindset. It's not easy to do, right? So easy to fall back into, but I have a quota and I must bring the numbers in and mm -hmm. I got to make it happen and I got to close. But this mindset is, is you're going to hit a wall very quickly with that. Mm. That's very much like it would limit anything you can possibly do because you're going to rush through everything, isn't it? Yes. You need to take your time with things. Make sure, yeah, taking things not personal is, is like the ultimate. Like it's, like it's like being stoic in that instance. Like that, this person's went away from me. Okay. We got to realign and reassess. The challenge though with that is how do you know that your product is the right thing? So obviously you work for Salesforce, but let's say if you had your own SaaS company or your own SaaS product, is there some feedback you can take to iterate on your product or your service or your idea? Like how do you distinguish between good feedback and feedback that you should just not consider? So... Early stage startup goes a little bit beyond my my my. <laughs> no worries, dude. Right, this goes beyond my competence. If if I now talk start talking about early stage startup, people who see this podcast will be like, okay, now he's talking complete, you know, BS of, of, nah. of things that he doesn't know about. Um, look, I think um, in general, so customer feedback is is always super critical to take into account. And, um, you know, you, you just mentioned two things um, that, that, that kind of pushed the buttons with me. One is, you know, you're rushing everything and you're making it about you. And then the other is, is customer feedback. And this just happened to me last month. So January, end of the fiscal year at Salesforce. Um, big closing season at Salesforce, right? And it, it's actually crazy. Like the last week in January, everyone is in the office. They kind of ring the bells all the time. Um, there's a huge, like there's a, everyone's pumped, you know? So there's a, there's a massive atmosphere of like success and victory and failure and pressure, right? And I noticed that um, in January, first of all, I had a huge pipeline. Like my pipeline was very promising. Um, I had many, many deals that I needed to manage at the same time, but the exact thing happened that you uh, that you uh, related to is that um, I was trying to force close all of these deals, and for the majority of them, it didn't happen. Right, so I think out of let's say ten deals that were really promising that I had in the pipeline, I closed like three of them, and all of the other ones um, we basically came to the pricing stage, and then we didn't move on. And the reason was is that we were going way too fast. We were, we were trying to execute our process, which we have a very clear idea about, right? 
but without taking so much into the account the customer. Um, we were playing with discounts and with pricing and with timeline. You know, if you sign with us in January, you get the best pricing and so on and so forth. And in the end, I only closed actually, no, it was three deals, but but one of them was an existing customer and two of them were a new logo. And with the two no logo customers, uh, one of them, I had already started the process in December. So we actually followed a timeline that worked for both sides. Mm -hmm. already before Christmas, we gave this outlook of this, Hey, this is what we're going to do in January. And then end of January, you can sign and, and you get the best pricing on as a cherry on top, but they actually wanted this project. They wanted to start implementing in February. And then the other one, uh, the other one, I was only able to close after I left the office. So I left the office. I took the train up to Malahide with a friend, which is uh, north of Dublin. And I had the final closing call with the CIO on the train when there was nobody around me listening and trying to help and being like, hey, uh, there's legal and there's this and that and we need to close it. Actually, when I when I slowed down and calmed down and just had a person to person conversation with this guy, I was able to close it. So um, sometimes and I'll wrap this one up. Sometimes as sales reps, we kind of have to play with the rules that our companies give us, which in January is you have to finish your fiscal year and you can now give the best pricing and you got to make it happen. <laughs> kind of <laughs> that I have, but then also my customers who are Swiss entrepreneurs, who first of all are not budget sensitive because Swiss people are the richest in the world, <laughs> some of the richest in the world. And for them, what's much more important than price is relationship and trust. Mm -hmm. And once you come with this kind of American mindset of, hey, you get the best price in January, you almost lose them. So it's really difficult to kind of juggle both. That's wild, man. How do you build trust? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love the saying that goes, you could, it takes years to build trust, but only seconds to lose it right mm -hmm. so when it comes to trust of course there's things that you can do to build it um but really the process of of building trust is a process of not giving the customer reasons to lose it <laughs> right if you think about it that way um mm -hmm. but things to build trust is slowing down not pushing your product or your service or your features, making it all about them, right? So trying to talk about their, their business problems. Also being informed, like doing your research, doing your homework and being informed about them and their business, mm -hmm. having a high level understanding of their business. Um, hearing them out, listening to them rather than talking. Mm -hmm. Taking, taking their objections very serious, right? So we always talk about overcoming objections. Well, if someone gives you an objection and you try to overcome <clears throat> that objection, um, I don't think that that creates trust because it means I'm not really hearing you. I'm trying to go over the road, roadblock that you're giving me rather than actually dismantling it. So saying, okay, here's the objection. What's, what's behind that objection, right? So if someone says this is too expensive, Asking, okay, what, what makes you think that? Do you think that this is just really overpriced? Or do you think it's actually not giving you the value that we discussed? Um, or if someone says, I'm not interested, does that mean that you just invested in a different solution that's a competitor of ours? Or this problem is actually not a problem that you have? You know, like between every objection that, that a prospect gives, never take that as fa at face value, but always try mm -hmm. to peel the onion back so those are things to gain trust and then mm. things to, things to lose trust is to say sign in january and you get a 40 percent discount <laughs> yeah i feel like that maybe in that space as well that people drop their prices too quickly maybe just try get the tr try get it done at, at any cost which by dropping 50 percent is how you're going to lose all trust yeah and I mean, with, with that one, right, with, with big discounts is um, if you give a big discount just like that, customers like uh, you do, you, you lose your credibility, right? 
because it means if you can just give 50% discount, that means it was highly overpriced to begin with. Because otherwise, how could you how could you drop the price like that? And also psychologically, psychologically, it, it decreases the perceived value if if you mm. drop the price like that. Exactly, man. Because I think they'll just come to do some calculation, being like, "Oh, it's only worth this much. They've only put this much amount of time into it. We don't need to check. We don't need to pay them the full amount." When you said about the discounts, did you mean that was only for like one month or like one year? Like, how does that work? Um, I mean. We don't have to go too deep into the, into the Salesforce pricing mechanics. In this case, that would be uh, their overall price for the for the entire contract. Yeah, I mean, depends. That what makes you sense. Negotiate, right? you, you can also say okay for the first year only, but yeah, usually it's for the for the full contract. I was wondering for the full length of it. You know, like how does it work for the full length? But um, Christian, this was sick. I really really enjoyed it, man. I didn't want to keep you too long, but this was like a good concentrated forty five minutes, fifty minutes. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed it. And I mean, we only did targeting, messaging, objection handling, and discovery today, and some mutual action plan. Actually, mm -hmm. we also did pricing. Fair enough. We almost we, we almost uh, covered the entire sales cycle. But yeah, um, look, I really enjoyed this uh, the, uh, this this kind of talk. And let me know if you if you want to do it again at some stage. Of course, man. Let's do our next session in, in person, man. That's where I look at it. When I get back to okay. Europe or you come out come out to Asia for a bit of a vacation, we'll do a in person podcast then. I have a I have a Bali trip planned later this year. Maybe that's not so far away from you, right? Man, I'll be there. <laughs> let's yeah. uh let's have a discussion about that offline. <laughs> awesome. Cheers, man.